So this is one of my favorite topics, health and hearty greens is the topic today, health and hearty greens. So the agenda today, um, it will align with uh, the, the other previous talks that I've given, and it will really connect with wellness in general. So we'll discuss diabetes as our health topic, just as a background, but we're hearing more and more about eating nutrient dense foods and what exactly is that. Um, so we'll talk about that today. And of course, hearty greens. And then the most fun part of the talk is going to be giving examples of some green superfoods. And then we'll answer the question in the end, what is your core? Okay, so again, non-communicable diseases, which is what we treat as physicians and as doctors, it accounts for 80% of deaths in the world today. 50% of them, according to the World Health Organization, are actually preventable. So we can actually do something about it. Uh, COVID amassed less than 7 million deaths so far on planet Earth. Um, and that's over the two-year period. But cardiovascular disease and cancer, as you can see here, is more than almost 30 million deaths, which is four times what we're seeing for COVID in a single year. And in the corner there, I showed there that three times uh, diabetes uh, can actually have a mortality three times of what's normal. So today, I talked in my previous talks about modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. Today, we're going to focus on a modifiable risk factor. Cardiovascular disease, as you know, still the leading cause of mortality, as mentioned before, but we can actually modify this. And so that's the beauty of this. So risk factor, diabetes will be the talk today. And I know people who have actually reversed their diabetes. They presented to the hospital uh, where I work and they presented with an A1C of 11. And today, I can't mention their names, but they're actually A1C is five. So don't accept a diagnosis. Fight, try and make it uh, abolish from your health history totally and keep it that way. And as we get into the new year, we will talk about uh, the next talk on habits and how we can create those habits to lead a much healthier life. So this is from a world perspective. In the next 20 years, you can see all the numbers here with the arrows. The numbers are increasing. In the United States, will be 33% increase in diabetes. Around the world, it's going to be 51% increase in diabetes. With an increasing population, with, with an increase in this one single focus today, non-communicable disease, diabetes, you can see that we're heading into another epidemic. It's already happening. And the numbers are just staggering. And so just in the United States alone, looking across the map of the United States over the last few decades, you can see from left to right, the increase in the shade, increase in the shaded area means increase in density and number of diabetes from age 18 and older, according to the CDC. It also correlates with the increase in obesity. So according to the American Diabetes Association, 30 million people, including adults and children, have diabetes. But look at the next number, 84 million have pre-diabetes. That's more than three times what the number of current diabetics are. Worst of all is that 90% don't even know they have it unless they go and get checked. And that's what we're going to talk about next year earlier. What are the, what are the um, markers that you can ask your doctor to perform in order to know, am I diabetic, am I pre-diabetic? And then you can make changes. So... You need to be aware of our challenges. Some of our challenges are that some of our patients don't even get screened. And I'm, I'm talking from a personal perspective, not from a healthcare system. So if you look here on the right, you know, bottom chart, it shows that 46% uh, of people are actually treated for diabetes. So that means they already have the diagnosis, but you can see that they're still uncontrolled. That means that the sugar in their blood systemically is still on the higher level. It's still abnormal. And so <clears throat> we still have some challenges that, that we are facing. Of course, you can see in blue, uh, some people have the diagnosis and they're treated and they are controlled, but that's only 20.9%. And some people are actually not treated and underdiagnosed. So we have all different spectrums of what we see in practice. Now in the right up, upper corner, which is what we're going to be talking about, uh, what are the complications? So what happens if you have diet? Diabetes. So what if you have diabetes? Well, I talked to you, I said already that you can have a three times risk of having heart disease and actually younger presentation for heart disease is what we're seeing. 
You can have blindness, stroke, kidney disease. In fact, every 21 seconds, someone is diagnosed of diabetes in the United States. So you can imagine in the rest of the world. And the CDC has now confirmed this with this infomercial confirming the same data I just gave you. 84 million um, adults have prediabetes and nine out of 10 don't even know they have it. So we have some work to do with screening. The complications from diabetes stretch from coronary artery disease, heart failure, peripheral artery disease, and that means low blood flow to your leg, stroke, which is a, a major cause of death, um, neuropathy, and what this means is just kidney disease, nephropathy. Every one point on the A1C, and I mentioned this before, people say, oh, my A1C is eight, when normal is five. So every one point in the A1C can decrease your risk of, for instance, here you see 21% decrease in dying. Look at 43% decrease in having an amputation of a toe or a limb. That's huge. And even 37% decrease in risk of kidney dysfunction. Just showing you here, diabetes and peripheral vascular disease as shown in this table here in red from this German National Hospital data shows that peripheral vascular disease and diabetes are the two largest causes of why someone gets an amputation. And look at the numbers at the bottom here, looking at 270,000 patients looking at this data. So a lot of people get amputations based on diabetes as a diagnosis. And in the United States, if you're on hemodialysis, the number one reason why will be diabetes. The second leading cause is high blood pressure. So again, I want you to think about that for a second. Is it better to change a modifiable risk factor like diabetes and eat healthier and really seek that strategy for improving one risk factor that's modifiable, I think it's worth it to keep my toes, to keep my limbs, and not be on dialysis. That's a very grim picture. But we talked before that diabetes is also part of that spectrum of inflammation because we're living in this inflammation age, and so with the increase of diabetes comes increase in inflammation. But not just that. As we are understanding this complex metabolic disorder, and of course the inflammation, throughout the entire body, not just affecting our toes and kidneys, but also our liver is affected. And <clears throat> I've never heard of this term before, liver disease with diabetes, is because now and now it's more and more prevalent. 10, 20 years ago, unheard of. So today we're seeing more and more liver disease and the whole gut microbiome tying into that, and that will be a topic for another talk. But there's an entity called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I want you to look at that term. It's non-alcoholic, yet your liver is getting disease from it. And again, if you look at this table, it's really from the food we eat. It says here unhealthy lifestyle, but somehow or the other, what we eat gets digested, goes into our gut, and there's a lot of inflammation that's coming from the gut and the microbiome that then affects the liver where all, all food travels through the liver before it goes into the bloodstream. Now let's look at the whole world. You can see here the global prevalence of this non-alcoholic and FLD is fatty liver disease. So N-A-F-L-D, other people call it NASH, N-A-S-H. Either way, just taken from a global perspective, 55% of people that have diabetes type two have liver disease. So that's something to also think about now, that you have liver disease, 50% of the time, if you have this, and even, even when they you know, look at studies, you can see here on the bottom, when patients with diabetes type two undergo a liver biopsy, you can see here that 17% have advanced fibrosis. So liver disease have different spectrums. As you start from normal healthy liver, you go through the whole spectrum until it becomes fibrosed. Once it becomes fibrosed, that becomes an end stage in liver disease. So again, this is all preventable. But this is one disease entity, one risk factor that is a modifiable risk factor. And I want to stress that it's just one thing we're dealing with today. Again, to confirm in Lancet, article 2022 journal, uh, the prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in patients with diabetic is anywhere from 55 to 70%. And you can see the different ranges from Europe, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and United States. So it's very high prevalence. <laughs> of non-alcoholic liver disease. The reason why I put this slide back is because imagine being a diabetic 
and having 50% chance of having liver disease and then drinking on top of that risk factor. That cannot be helping the situation. So alcohol versus non-alcohol disease, uh, two different entities in itself. One other thing I want to mention here is metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is a, is a term that was coined based on having any three or five risk factors. And I want to show you this data because it's very important when talking about diabetics. So number one, the person have to have the risk factors are abdominal obesity. So it means the size of your waist, the size of the belt that you wear around your waist. Two is hypertension, high blood pressure. According to this, a systolic more than 130. Three risk factor, third risk factor is having a high glucose level. So even being a pre-diabetic means you're walking around with a higher than normal fasting blood glucose. And four and five have to do with triglycerides, which relates to your liver also. So having any three of these, so people can actually be slim and not have any abdominal obesity, but have three of the other risk factors. For instance, someone can have high blood pressure, abnormal triglycerides, and high glucose level or pre-diabetic. Those are the simple three. And what they looked at, and again, the CDC, Center for Disease Control, looked at data from 1988 to 2012. And again, just looking at three of these factors, what they found was if you look at the bottom of this graph, the people in this study, 12,000 adults were looked at. And look at the data, the three lowest most graphs here over 150 month period, looking at mortality rate, the people all bunched up in this last three graphs had no metabolic syndrome. METS means metabolic syndrome. It means that they did not have three of the risk factors I just showed you. But look at what happens with the other three graphs here. Even normal weight metabolic syndrome had the highest mortality. So I want you to think about that for a second. So I'm sure you know someone who is slim, who have a normal weight, who is not obese, and yet they had a heart attack or yet they died. This is what we're talking about. This was surprising data also, looking at taking a cohort of patients, getting the demographics, and data today is king, looking and seeing what can we do to eliminate those risk factors. So in general, to summarize that whole data, metabolic syndrome, it have a little bit to do with genetic, it have a lot to do with dietary, what we eat, what we put in, the gut, microbiota, what gut, uh, bacteria we have physical activity is extremely important and other factors some things we can change and some things we cannot change what we can uh, you know consider non-modifiable risk factors are age and sex that leads to metabolic disease which are the things i talked about high blood pressure the glucose being high which is diabetes triglycerides plus or minus obesity because i just showed you that normal weight had the highest mortality if they have the other risk factors and you can see that metabolic syndrome so complex as we're learning from it still, this is still 2017 data, you can see that it can lead to things like not just cardiovascular disease, but also cancer, the two leading cause of mortality I showed you. Okay, so now that we know that this is very important as a background, so what is nutrient-dense foods? Everybody keeps saying you need to eat nutrient-dense, but what does it really mean? What do I tell my kids when they say, what does nutrient-dense mean? So, uh, we look at nutrient dense, it simply means, this is, this is from the American Heart Association definition. It means eating new food that is more nutrient rich. So when they compare the American standard diet, it's energy rich, has a lot of calories in it, but it's nutrient poor. Okay, so that's a classic example, right, of the American Heart Association website. Okay, so when we say energy, they're meaning calories. So it's the nutrients, Per calories, and I'm going to show you an example because this is very important. So here we go with with five Starburst candy. I hope I don't get called from the Starburst company. Uh, so five Starburst candy have 100 calories. One medium banana, 100 calories. Which one is more nutrient dense? Well, clearly the banana is nutrient dense. Why? It has vitamins, it has it has carbohydrates, and it has vitamins that are nutrient for you. Compared to a Starburst, have most likely zero of vitamins and zero of anything that's nutritious. Nutritious. So look again at, at the table on your right. Again, comparing brown rice is more nutrient rich than processed white rice that have little or no nutrients in it. 
a whole grain bread have something of nutritional value to it, like grain and bran, which we talked about. Roast chicken compared to processed meat that have a lot of uh, chemicals, preservatives, is much better. Fruits and vegetables, always much better than candies, which is just pure sugar. Again, nuts and seed, a thousand times much better than potato chips. And again, yogurt have its own probiotics and uh, protein, vitamins, nutrients in it compared to just plain vanilla ice cream. So those are just examples of what do we mean by nutrient dense? Because for most, for most part, that's where we should, that's where we need to push our health in 2023 and beyond is nutrient dense food. So again, all of the colors of the rainbow are actually full of nutrient dense uh, foods. And I want to bring you back to this 195 country data because it focuses, this is a very important paper. I want to bring up the point that Byron just mentioned that, uh, you know, I'm presenting data. What does data mean? To get a publication, it's not very simple. It's almost like publishing a book. If I ask anyone on the call, how many people publish a book? Well, or write an article that stays in the literature forever. This is what a publication means. And this data is out there, but you have to look for it. And you have to have some means of actually getting it to you. In the library, it's online. Uh, you can uh, pull this data, but you have to have a membership in certain uh, libraries in order to get this data. So just to show you an example, all the data I'm presenting and always present is going to come from what we call review data. Someone have to actually pay for someone to actually do the study, and it takes sometimes a lot of people. And when I say people, I mean uh, professors. And you can see here on the left, this was done by you know Professor Christopher J. L. Murray. Okay, and this was done in Seattle, Washington, USA. And so most papers have more than one author, means more than one, uh, more than one person is actually getting the paper together, getting the data together, getting it reviewed, and presenting uh, it in a format for presentation like this to be published. And you can see funding has to come somewhere. Somebody has to pay money for this. Somebody's getting paid. And so you can see here the funding here is the Gates Foundation. So somebody decided, say, okay, what is the cause of, uh, let's look at, this is 195 countries. So most likely your country is included. Trinidad and Tobago is also included, which I'm part of. And so they look at data and they wanted to find out, they showed that 11 million people died from these 195 countries. And then they really looked deep into finding out what are the dietary risk, why the patient died. Not looking at blood pressure and, uh, and diabetes anymore, but just let's focus on what they ate as far as we can tell from the data. And again, I've showed the slide before, it's very important because this is new data, and this is what a lot of uh, policies and legislation and changes are being made around this data. So from the data comes results and strategies. And you can see here that the most common cause is in the right bar, and you can see from the bottom, cardiovascular disease is in red. Why people died is of cardiovascular disease, but when they look at the, of their diet, just focus on what they ate, clearly they ate they had a high sodium diet, but they had a diet low in grains, low in fruits, low in nuts, low in vegetables. So it's not telling you what they had a lot of. So when you analyze the data, it was due to certain foods omitted from their diet versus what was in the diet. Okay, so it's of omission, not of what they actually took. In fact, when you look at the bottom here, diets high in red meat, that did not cause, that really didn't account for the majority of deaths. Seen here, the majority of deaths, 11 million people died, 195 countries came because of omission of fruits, vegetables, seeds. So clearly we have a problem here. So when people talk about and make, make jokes about, did you eat your broccoli today or did you eat your greens? This is serious stuff. So let's look now at the CDC data of what our kids are doing. And so this is high school kids in the United States. What they do is they actually poll from different states in the United States. You can see here most of the uh, um, data came from Maryland, but either way, they try to get as many states as possible. This is 33 states. And you can see here a summary of the entire total cohort. Um, you can see here that uh, easily uh, fruits and vegetables in terms of the recommendation, only 7% of kids got their fruit and recommend uh, fruit for the, uh, per day recommended as what is recommended by the US department. And vegetables has always been the lowest, 2%. That is extremely, extremely uh, unacceptable. When we look at adults, 
And this data came out in 2017, but the data itself was compiled in 2015. And again, when we put together a guideline, what is recommended, and I'll show you what the guidelines is for different countries and the website to go and get it, but using the American guideline, dietary 2015 to 2020, they want to look at the results and say, okay, we put a guideline in place, let's see what the results are. Well, the results are also horrible for adults because only 12% met their meted recommendations for taking fruits and vegetables and always vegetables always lagging behind. So I think we're going to start seeing more and more infomercials like this from the American Heart Association. You're going to start seeing more and more infomercials talk because after all the data and knowledge that's accumulated over the last decades and looking at how many lives have been lost because uh, they omitted things from their diet. How do we get people to change their behaviors in order to lead a healthier life and wellness? And so clearly we're seeing how awesome fruits and vegetables and seeds and plant nutrition have on health and wellness in general. And all the data is pointing to the same thing. So vegetables seems to be the toughest one. So we're going to focus on the greens today. And that's why the topic was labeled green health. So we'll focus on, on the greens. And just to show you the greens, what it looks like, what we're talking about. But again, summary of, of the last five year nutritional data showed, if you see here in the second bar, total vegetables, what's below in blue is where we're not meeting the recommendations. And even, even the purple that actually met in you know, recommendation is actually refined grains, which have little value to us. And so we really want to focus on whole grains, which is why brown rice and whole grains is what's important. So clearly, we're in trouble when we're looking at, at uh, the health of not just a country, but the entire world. Um, that data was from 195 countries. So strategies in place, of course. The strategy is how to, how to increase consumption of fruits and vegetables. I'm not going to tell you my strategies. But again, one in 10 adults get enough, uh, don't get enough uh, fruits and vegetables. This is the World Health Organization website. So let's go and see what the rest of the world is doing after finding out this data. So a healthy diet. Clearly a healthy diet is shown to protect against malnutrition, but it also protects against non-communicable diseases, which I said 80% of deaths is from non-communicable diseases, and most of them are diabetes, heart disease, and stroke and cancer. So you can actually go on this website. 100 countries have actually submitted their guidelines for what they propose based on their environment, based on their culture, what their diet should look like. And I want to show you just a couple of them. And so this is an example. You can go on there and everyone posted their um, what their diet should look like. So Canada posted this. And you can go on their Ministry of Health website and get this. But again, so you can see here that they basically said to just have plenty of vegetables and fruits. So 50% of their plate is vegetables and fruits. This is the recommended this is the recommendation for Canada. And you can see protein here is about a quarter and whole grains makes up one quarter. And they're gonna stick with that. This is, this, is the, this is Afghanistan here in the middle. And you can see that they have their naan and, and their grains and what they call tubers, cereals. They have their pulses and beans one side and they decided to make it slightly different. They have their oils and fats, they have their fruits and they have their vegetables. Look at how much vegetables they have there. So this is Afghanistan uh, uh, government putting together their health uh, recommendations. The Chinese plate, uh, a little bit sophisticated with their chopsticks, but you can see here that uh, the purple is actually one of the smallest ones here. And the purple is the smallest ones. The rest of it is really plant-based nutrition, from the cereals to the legumes to fruits and vegetables. It's almost three quarters that are plant-based, uh, whereas protein makes up uh, uh, the least of their plate. And they even went on on the Chinese menu to even put jogging in there and running. And you can see a breakdown of what their diet looks like. So every country has put this in. And I want you to see consistently across all, all the countries, all the major countries, what you will find is that there is a lot of uh, vegetables and green that have to be included as the foundational uh, meal. Now, I want to take you to the Mediterranean diet. So this is from Greece. Again, everything could, uh, you can actually get off the website from the World Health Organization. And you can see here that monthly red meat is eaten. And that's the recommendation that red meat is monthly. Weekly are things uh, in the second part of this triangle 
but daily, and they also include some physical activity and, and some red wine. I can't argue with that. Um, but you can see here that vegetables found uh, forms one of their foundations at the bottom. So very important to include vegetables and fruits and plant-based um, in order to lead a healthy lifestyle. 2022, learning from our lessons, what we've learned, we failed miserably. The American Institute for Cancer Research proposed a new, what they call the new American plate. So you're going to be seeing a lot of infomercials about this coming out where they put a number on it. So two-thirds is now vegetables, fruits, more grains and beans. And they make it very simple. One third or less are proteins, animal proteins, to be specific. So this is the new numbers going into the new year and hopefully in the 21st century. So all countries had something similar to this. This is United Kingdom, Britain, using their, uh, their plate, their recommendation. Again, uh, no numbers on it, but fruits and vegetables and uh, grains pick up the majority. And the minority is going to be uh, animal-based products. And they have this um, infomercial that's showing that at least five a day. So how you ever want to count it? Just count five fruits and vegetables every day and make sure you have that satisfied in order to meet their goal, which is very simple. So the goodness of greens, greens was found in every single diet. There was not one single national plate without greens. My problem with greens or any vegetable is, as you see here in the bottom, they spoil so easily. And so you just have to eat them in time. And I think somebody works on, work on that to have them uh, last longer. I think uh, they will have a better chance of people using it. So good, let's get on to the fun part. Examples of green superfood. How are we doing with time? Okay, good. So this is Penn University. It's an Ivy League university. So I was surprised going and seeing one of my favorite green foods, aloe vera plant on Penn University website. It's like, wow, and look at this. They even put diabetes on there. It affects 30 million Americans. So this is, this is amazing to see. And I think we're going to see a trend, not just in Harvard Medicine. I think Stanford is also starting up also. But this is some of the top universities that are starting to put it out there to let the, let the public know that these plant-based medicines and plant-based nutrition, I should say, not medicines, are actually something to look back uh, on and in order to help us with our health and wellness. So, again, to publish one of these papers in one of these journals that are good journals, uh, it's a real process. It, has, it takes funding. It takes a lot of doctors. And as you can see here, the, these are the doctor's name. This is the name of the topic. This is the name of the journal. But the amount of effort and energy that goes into this, it's truly a mastermind when you have different professors uh, that study at the top of their level, um, just like myself, and write an article and do all the review of the literature, looking back for decades and bringing this to the forefront to show and summarize it. And you can see here from the aloe vera plant, uh, again, looking at, you know, the phyto components in it, the aloe vera plant helps with diabetes, again, liver disease immunomodulation to improve your immune system, and even in cancer and antioxidants. This has been the theme of most of the products that we've seen so far. Again, aloe vera being called a miracle gift. And so, again, massive anti-inflammatory agents that are within the plant, antiviral, wound healing, anti-cancer, anti-diabetic. And so when we look at plants that are looked at right now, moving forward uh, in the 21st century, see which plants can we focus on as a diabetes to help prevent the 80, 84 million or the worldwide pandemic with diabetes. Well, it's right in your backyard. If for those of you who actually have aloe vera plant, my grandfather used to give me this to drink uh, when I was young. <laughs> Didn't know that, uh, I guess at that time, there was no research done compared to what's done today. So I'm lucky to be here with you. Uh, management of diabetic complications. We talked about the, the, the horrid, uh, Complications from diabetes, including amputation, renal failure, kidney disease. And so, again, this is a paper, uh, you know, published just looking at the management of the diabetic complications. And again, when they look at all the different uh, compounds that are found in plants that help diabetics, you can see here that flavonoids, all, all the different phytochemicals that are, uh, uh, you know, innate to plants, you can see here that it actually helps to prevent all of the complications that's associated with diabetes. So I think this is very uh, 
you know, favorable as a good summary of how, how do plants help diabetes. Again, many science papers focus on hypoglycemia and again, most of these studies are done and you can look here, see eight weeks, eight weeks period, imagine, forget about eight weeks, imagine taking, you know, a uh, uh, nutrient dense uh, diet for a year, a month, eight years, 80 years, right? I mean, imagine the benefits. So these studies were just done in eight weeks and they saw a decrease in insulin resistance, which means improvement in diabetes, right? And they even suggest that it could be powerful in treating non-insulin diabetes, aloe vera, simple plan. This is fast forward to 2020, to 2020. Again, looking at all of the aloe vera, you know, benefits, again, anti, you know, anti-cancer effects, anti-diabetic effects, good digestion, uh, cardio protection. Of course, it has some skin, but anti-inflammatory. So again, a huge amount of anti-inflammation in, in just one of my favorite uh, plants. Um, again, specific now to diabetes, it's been known to have anti-diabetic roles. And this is the NIH uh, giving their explanation in 1996. And so you can see that a lot of work has been done from since then to now looking at the uh, aloe vera plant for anti-diabetic uh, cure. Again, when we summarize some of these uh, you know, publications, this is just giving what's called a meta-analysis. All of them consistently showed uh, no toxins, no, no toxic side effects, but only improvement in all of the diabetes uh, symptoms and profile. Again, same, same thing. And even our favorite uh, black cumin seed, uh, we also saw that this also have massive amounts of uh, anti-inflammatory effects. And so I had to mention uh, I had to mention that here today. Systemic review of herbs and dietary supplements. Again, this is looking at 108 clinical trials. Okay, 36 herbs, 4,000 patients with diabetes actually were looked at, and this is published in Diabetic Care more than two decades ago. And again, even at that time, they highlight that 16 million populations, in, uh, people in the United States had diabetes. So again, using herbs and glycemic control for diabetes. You can see here the aloe vera plant was looked at in these meta-analyses. And again, no side effects at all. You can see here no side effects, decrease. So this is fasting glucose, uh, blood glucose level. So all of them, even one showed ABA1C, which I showed you A1C level was actually decreased. So you can actually decrease your A1C level with, uh, with some of these um, herbs. This is aloe vera here in this table, sorry for the confusion, but this is also milk thistle. This is another one of the compounds, which is one of the favorite greens, also shows decrease in A1C level, which we'll get to later on. So again, evaluation of clinical trial. This is a more recent paper, 2021, very recent, looking at the same thing for diabetes. And you can see aloe vera comes, uh, uh, you know, comes up in these meta you know, analyses and shows the same thing again, decrease in glucose, uh, throughout all the trials. So very good study. You can see that the, the study period was 42 days, as low as 42 days, but as most as three months. So imagine taking this ongoing as a habit. We get into the next one, which is called milk thistle. Again, 2,000 years, um, it's been around as a remedy and being used. And again, to highlight anti-inflammatory, anti-tumor effects of these herbs, even Mount Sinai site quotes the same thing, 2,000 years. It's used for hepatitis, for liver disease. It's cancer. Um, Anti-cancer properties are also something that's, uh, that's also looked at. And again, the Mayo Clinic, the NIH also mentions its use, again, diabetes and liver disease. So the topic today was diabetes, and you can see a lot of these uh, herbs are used for diabetes. Uh, milk thistle on medical news today, again, anti-diabetes and also helps to lower cholesterol. My, oh, wow. One of my favorite, my friends would always ask me to, to plant this. This is called green grass. And so some of my friends plant this green grass and they actually get the juice from it. And I can tell you it's very tedious to do. I never tried it. They would bring it to work all the time and it's this green juice in a bottle that they drink. Um, uh, they're very healthy, uh, needless to say. But when you look at green grass juice, even at the clinical uh, Cleveland Clinic Health Library, again, benefits, right? Seven benefits on Cleveland Clinic Health Library showing fights inflammation and fights cholesterol. So my friend is onto something. He's doing something well. I just don't like to plant grass and then, and then have to try and squeeze the juice out of it. <laughs> All right, kale. 
Well, kale, this is from the Harvard website. We all know kale, even I bought kale um, because of all the hype around kale. Kale became a celebrity status in, in 2012 as a you know, vegetable. And again, it became uh, the year of kale. It was even made National Kale Day. So you can imagine, I don't want to say much about kale, that it's green and it's good for you. So clearly all the benefits are there. Uh, cholera, this is a, a superfood. Um, again, massive antioxidants, a source of protein, which I didn't even know about. I didn't realize it had so much protein in it. And um, when we look at the review of this, 2020 review, looking at a detail, and most of these papers are actually 20, 30 pages long, by the way. I'm just showing you two pages to save you the uh, headache of reading um, from these papers. But when you look at all the different varieties, A to M, of brands on the market of uh, chlorella, you can see here that proteins make up about 50, almost 50 grams in a 100 gram dry weight. And so it's a lot of proteins. And this is what we mean by nutrient dense. Nutrient dense means it's full of nutrients that are good for you. And look at the protein content. This is the amino acid scale on this. And it has your essential amino acids, means that your body have to take it by food, by mouth. Uh, your body cannot make it. Non-essential amino acids, our body synthesizes it and make it. Okay, but the essentials, we cannot uh, live without the essential amino acids. And so you can see here the potential benefit of this simple, simple uh, herb. Sprolina, again, another uh, Another great herb on the Mount Sinai website and Cleveland Clinic website. Again, antioxidant is good for your heart. Immune system also helps with cancer and chronic diseases. Dandelions, very common. Again, people, you can see this almost you know, everywhere. Um, chock full of nutrients, again, dense nutrients. Cleveland Clinic website puts it in the health library. And you can see that it has a lot of vitamins, zinc, but this is the most important part. It's actually used to add flavor. The salad, uh, sandwiches, teas. So clearly it also helps in, in other health diseases, but it also has a good taste. So you find it in, in things like wines, as you can see here, it's also used to make wine and good taste. And speaking about good taste, let's look at the ingredients of one of the major products core. When we look at it, I want you to start first with the calories because what, what nutrient dense means is that you get a lot of nutrients and a lot of good stuff that's good for you with little calories only 15 calories compared to any other food. That's pretty remarkable. And this is a one ounce packet. And you can see here, the milk thistle seed, which I showed before. We know the black cumin seed from Seoul. Uh, kale powder, you know, the superfood, the, uh, the celebrity of, uh, of greens. Cholera, I just told you how much amino acids there is. Sprolina, we just discussed that. Aloe vera, one of my favorite. And so dandelion gives it this nice taste and wheatgrass, which hopefully I don't have to plant and grow because I can, just, I can just drink my soul, I mean, my core. Okay, black cumin seeds, so these, these are the ingredients, of course, most widely need, known seed in the world. It's in there. We have kale, we have cranberry seed, we have spirulina, milk thistle, wheatgrass. And again, uh, delivering eight to nine servings of some of the contents in fruits and vegetables, I think that's remarkable. Uh, I think we have a huge opportunity here uh, to help uh, bridge that gap in our lack of taking vegetables and, and things that we think are not, doesn't taste good. Well, here is, here's the solution right here. And so again, antioxidants, anti-inflammatory, detoxification maintains cholesterol and all the benefits of all the fruits and vegetables, especially the green vegetables. Again, how our food that we eat interacts with our DNA and interacts with, uh, with us as a human being affects our health. And we want to pay close attention going into 2023 and beyond of uh, what we're actually doing to improve our health. Every risk factor we see here, here is all, uh, all risk factors optimal, okay, uh, in, in terms of uh, age and years and lifetime risk of dying from cardiovascular disease. The more risk factors we have is the more chance of us not being here to live our best life and to live to, to 100 years old and here to build a legacy. So we really want to pay attention to those risk factors. Diabetes is a risk factor we want to put behind us. We want to, uh, we want to get checked. We want, to, we want to see if we can improve on that. And, and now we have a strategy. So let thy food be thy medicine. Uh, very, very important. That's what this is all about. This is just food-based nutrition. It's all about food. Um, for those of you who like food, this is it. You're on, you're on the right webinar. And thank you.
So I'm uh, going to summarize just because of time. Seed nutrition, again, has been the backbone of great health since the ancient times. And the world is not, uh, and its food is different today than compared to ancient time. I think we're going to see more and more infomercials supporting uh, most of these herbs into our diet. Um, I'm sure online you can you can get these things, but now we have a convenient way of, of actually taking it in. Uh, Non-communicable diseases continue to be the leading cause of mortality. Seed nutrition, massive benefits. I can't stress it enough. Uh, it's safe. It's been around for decades and, and counting. So thank you all very much for your time. Wow. Well, thank you, Dr. Beckles. We appreciate you. Um, and I love how you, as you're sharing this uh, with everybody, uh, and you're sharing these reports and sharing these numbers and sharing these studies that it's, it's not, as you were stating, I mean, there's a lot of time and energy and effort and work uh, that has gone into these. It's not, you know, somebody's opinion. I mean, these are basically what they're seeing that results from, from their research. And it's pretty alarming to see that all of this is going on and how many of us really aren't aware of all of the things that are happening around the globe and all of the, impacts that you know our lifestyle is having or the things that we're omitting is is having in our life it's very unfortunate it's very unfortunate that only when we present to the hospital that we when we're sick and no one has ever heard of anything like diabetes and why didn't anybody tell me and but i think that uh, more and more social media is going to change that i mean we're going to see more and more of these infomercials coming out um more and more of these slides will show up everywhere, um, <laughs> similar to what I have. But the amount of work it takes and research and analysis it takes to bring a product from, from a garden and put it into something that's usable and sold in a store um, or bring to someone's table is extremely, extremely uh, remarkable. And the amount of science behind it uh, looking and looking and looking to find uh, all the different uh, benefits of these herbs that they bring to us. And again, it's been 2,000 years that these herbs have been around, but no one has applied the science to it to see, hey, what if we use this for curing diabetes? Look, we have a we have an epidemic in diabetes. Why not? Right? Yeah. People are doing oh, and, it. Yeah. And the, and the fact that, you know, it seems like it's not being talked about, almost like, you know, it's something that should be, you know, I don't know. It's just weird that you don't see it everywhere. And, and I, I love what you're saying. And hopefully we do, we get more of that information and that education and those little infomercials and all of this type of stuff. Cause it's, it's affecting lives. I think all of us, if we look internally at our friends and our family, those that are closest to us, people we know in our neighborhood, um, we see it. It's affecting lives and families all across the world. Absolutely. It hits home. It hits home every day. You look around, I'm sure. You could label 10 people you know, and one out of 10 will have diabetes or had some heart disease or had some cancer, um, and we just accept it. But what I'm saying is we don't have to accept things that are modifiable. Modifiable means we can modify it, but we have to put it as our priority. And that's what we'll talk about next year is habits. How do we get the right habits in order to make something change, how to make that small change every day in our lives? Uh, ah, wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing today, Dr. Beckles, we appreciate you uh, taking your expertise. And as you mentioned, having access to a lot of these studies and having access to be able to see these reports and being willing to, to put it together and, and explain it in a way that I can understand, which is what we need. <laughs> I just appreciate your, uh, your professionalism and your desire to go out there and, and make a difference in a positive way. So thank you once again for all that you do. Love having you here and being able to to learn from you and just wish you the continued success in all you're doing to try to make people's lives better. Absolutely, Baron. Happy holidays to you and your family too.